Vandaag bij Antwoorden met Belis Conley. Parents, we need to try and speak those things to our children. Acceptance. Hey, you're my kid. You belong to this family. You're mine. Affection. And I love you. And even if they're not doing real well at the moment, you say, you know what, you've got what it takes. Elke dag zit u met zoveel vragen. Iedereen zoekt naar antwoorden. Persoonlijke antwoorden die ons kunnen sterken in ons geloof. Die antwoorden liggen soms voor het grijpen. Bereid u voor op Gods woorden die door de Bijbel tot u spreken. En vind de antwoorden met Bayless Conley. Hello, welcome to the broadcast today. I'm Bayless Connolly, and today my wife Janet and I are both going to be bringing the word to you. We're talking about the family and the home. And listen, even if you're single and out on your own, there's going to be some key elements in this that will help you in your life. We're actually speaking about three powers in the home. And Janet and I sort of go back and forth. So get a pencil, get a paper, get your Bible. Let's get into the Word together. Aan het einde van de uitzending wil Belis nog een inspirerende gedachte met u delen. Dus blijf kijken. We're going to talk to you about three powers in the home. And they can unleash great influence when it comes to relationships. Husband-wife relationship, child-parent relationship, brother-sister. But, but these, these powers and this influence actually applies to every relationship in life. You can take these same principles we're going to talk about and see them work in your business relationships, in your friendships, in every other arena of life. So whether you're, you know, happily married, and you have a good marriage, well, it can get gooder. Um, if you got a bad marriage, God can salvage it and turn it into something absolutely beautiful beyond anything you've been able to imagine. Um, if you have a dysfunctional family, God can help you. You can become a conduit into that family that God's grace can flow through. If you're single and want to be married, God can help you. If you're single and never want to be married, God <laughs> has got a word for you. Um, and you know, that's okay. God uh, gives us all different ways, calls us to live all sorts of different lives for Him, for His glory. Amen. So uh, we're going to begin by talking about the power of words. You know, as the Bible opens up in the book of Genesis, we have this amazing account of creation. God spoke, and it came to be. God spoke, and it came to be. God said, and it was. God said, and it was. From flinging the stars into existence, the sun and the moon, to earth and all of the, the life, you know, that's upon it. God said it was. God said it was. God said it came to be. And then it says, and God made man in his own image and in his own likeness. You, you, you can't really miss the, the sequential order. God said it was. God said it was. God spoke. It came to be. God spoke. It came to be. Then God made man in his own image, with the ability to speak words. Yes. Then in a sense, have a creative nature about him. And the truth is, our own personal world, especially in this context of relationships that we're speaking about, has been influenced and affected greatly by the words that we have spoken Amen. as a habit of life. You see, words are containers. Words can contain joy, hope, peace, they can contain faith, and those kind of words build up, and they bring life, and they bring growth, but words can also contain hate, fear, despair, bitterness, spite, anger, and those kind of words tear down, and they crush. Proverbs 12 and 18 says this, thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words and heal. Proverbs 15 and 4. Kind words bring life, but, but cruel words crush your spirit. Most of the words we say are not neutral, even though I think we'd like to hope they are, believe they are. Most words that we say fall on one side of the ledger or the other. They're building up and bringing life, or they're crushing and bringing death. And life and death actually are not too strong of terms 
to use because the scripture says in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. That is for death or life. The kind of words they indulge in, the things that come out of a person's heart and find their way out their lips, the things that they speak as a habit of life will bring life or will bring death. I have a friend that, uh, well, as long as I've known him, this was his practice. His kids are grown now, but he would take them to school every day. And when he would drop them off at school, he'd say, okay, they'd get out of the car. He'd say, say it. And they go, oh, dad. He says, no, say it. All right, I'm a champion. And then he'd say, yes, you are. You're a champion. You have what it takes. I go in there and get him. You need to know I love you. And he'd send them off every single day with those kind of words. My friend, those kind of words will impact you and affect you, especially if you hear them from the time you're young. By contrast, all some people have heard is, you know, you're stupid. What, what's wrong with you? You know, you're, you're worthless. Can't you do anything? And a child that hears those things over and over, it can impact them as well in the wrong way. And we found in an early state that a lot of foolishness can be even bound up in a two-year-old's heart. <laughs> so in correcting the kids, you know, when they would do something, I, Jen, I don't think Jen and I ever said to any of them, you're a bad boy. You're a bad girl. I don't think we ever said that. A child hears that over and over their whole life. You're a bad boy. You're bad. You're bad. You're bad. People can somehow unconsciously grow up thinking they're inherently bad. And we would tell them, you know what? You're a good girl but you made a really bad decision. You made a bad choice, and all choices, all decisions have consequences. Now, you're a good girl. That was a bad choice. And part of your consequence right now is you're going to get corrected. <laughs> and it's, we're not correcting you because you're in trouble. We're, we're correcting you because we want to help you get out of trouble. Your bad decision puts you in trouble. This is the way out. But, but even in that correction, we told them, look, you're good. You just made a bad choice. And there is, there is a difference. You know, there's only one time recorded in Scripture that we have the Father speaking audibly to Jesus about Jesus. We have, God gave us no other record of anything the Father ever said to Jesus about Jesus. This is the only thing of, of all the things that God chose to put in his book to let us know that he said to his son, this is what he said, it's threefold. He said, you're my son that I love in whom I'm well pleased. It's the only record we ever have of God saying anything to his son about his son. You're my son, acceptance, that I love, affection, in whom I'm well pleased, affirmation. Parents, we need to try and speak those things to our children, acceptance. Hey, you're my kid, you belong to this family, you're mine, Amen. Amen. affection, and I love you. And even if they're not doing real well at the moment, you say, you know what, you've got what it takes. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 can, you can do that, you've got what it takes, you've got good inside of you, you've got potential inside of you, affirm them. Now even when it comes to husbands and wives and a marital relationship, words are so Powerful. Am I not correct, dear? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> they are. You know, Song of Solomon, I remember when I discovered this book. I was with a friend named Frances. She lived in a cabin in the woods. We're sitting on the porch of her cabin. Frances and I are both brand new Christians. And she's reading, she said, let me read the Bible. Just open it up at random, start reading. And she happened to open it up, Song of Solomon. Now, we're, we're brand new believers. She starts reading it, and I, I'm thinking, What? And I looked at her and says, wait a minute. I said, look, I know what those metaphors mean. This is pretty racy. Keep reading. <laughs> I was just so surprised. It's this, this love affair between Solomon and his Shulamite bride. And, you know, you don't have to imagine too much to realize what some of the metaphors are talking about. It's pretty graphic. But there's an interesting thing. In the very first chapter, the Shulamite bride speaks and she makes it clear that she is very insecure regarding her looks, her appearance. In fact, she even said, look, don't look at me. 
I think compared to the, the pampered, fair-skinned ladies of the court, she said, look, I've had to work out in the vineyards my whole life, and the sun has done a number on me. Don't even look at me. And then Solomon immediately begins, you read it, he compliments her body, compliments her features. He compliments her hair. He compliments her eyes. He compliments her nose. He compliments her lips. He compliments her teeth. He compliments her breasts. He compliments her tummy. He built her up in the area where she was most insecure. Understanding the power of words. Now again, by contrast, an acquaintance of mine was getting a lot of traction in ministry, pretty well known, and his marriage blew up. I honestly don't know what happened, but ended up getting a divorce. Sometime later, his ex-wife wrote a book, and the book was basically, you think this is what he is? Let me tell you what he's really like. And in the book, I remember I read part of it, and then I had to put it down. She talked about their wedding night. And she, she said, this is years later, said on our wedding night, he criticized my body and he made fun of the way I looked. Now, obviously, he was an idiot for doing that. He should have taken his cue from Solomon and complimented her. But it, it struck me then, and it still does now, at how those words he spoke to her, how deeply they wounded her. Words can cut like the piercing of a sword we just read to the point that this, this bitterness has grown in her and she's going to write about these critical words that, that wounded her and hurt her so deeply in her life. I think we need to think twice before we speak once. Even the book of James declares that our, our tongue, the words we speak, they're like a rudder on a ship determining the direction our life goes. And some, without realizing it, they're, they're going to run their family, run their marriage aground, you know, on, on the rocks of disaster by the words that they speak as a habit of life. We need to start saying the right things, things that build up, that, that bring confidence, security, and that bring hope. And I think Janet might have a little bit to say about the power of words. Sweetheart. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> that was all scripted. <laughs> We're talking about the power of words. And I think words mean so much to women. I, I think in the marriage relationship, you know, the, the sexual part speaks maybe more to the men, and the, the words are so powerful to the women. But words do affect all of us. But the power of words. And, and I just wanted to say, you know, everyone longs, for the words that God spoke to his son, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We long for that affection, for that acceptance, and for that affirmation. We do, our kids do. You know, my father was a great man. He was honest. He was moral. He was a hard worker. He did the very best he knew how. But in all my growing up, never did he tell me he loved me or did he ever hug me. He was really quite critical and it seemed like that we could never do anything well enough. Except one time, I do remember, we were all standing around my dad's desk, my brothers, and one of my brothers, we were looking at report cards, and one of my brothers goes, oh, you just think you're so smart. He was talking to me because you get good grades. And my dad stopped him, and he said, wait a minute, that's a good thing. And I still remember, this is 50 years ago, I still remember that today, how it impacted me and really touched my heart from my father. I so longed for, I craved his words of affirmation, his words of approval, his words of love. And growing up, it affected my self-esteem and really well into my adult years, I felt like I never really measured up. It was painful and it was gut-wrenching. And perhaps you've experienced something similar or maybe even worse. After I received Jesus and got saved, I started hugging my dad and telling him that I loved him. And then he started to do the same in return. That was really special and strengthening to me as his daughter. Over the years, through people and through God's word, I grew in understanding and being able to receive God's 
incredible, never-ending, overwhelming, incredible love. I forgave my dad completely, and my confidence and self-esteem have continually grown to where I'm at today. And I am so grateful that when we come to Jesus, we discover that we have a heavenly Father who freely gives us these words of affection and affirmation and acceptance 24-7. Anytime we need it, we can run to his word or we can listen and he'll remind us, you are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. I'm so, so grateful. It's wonderful. It's healing, isn't it? Thank you, Lord. I love this verse in Ephesians 5, 2. It's the last part of it in the, from the Message Bible. It says, God's love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. And then he says, love like that. He set the example. He loves extravagantly with words of affection and affirmation and acceptance. He, he wants us to do the same. And I love here where it says, and he didn't love in order to get something from us in return. He, didn't, he doesn't love us because we're really good or maybe we did something really well. Or even like for our kids that they cleaned their room or hit a home run. That's not why we should love them. We love them because the way God loves us. He loves us just because we are his and he is love. He's put that love in our heart too. And we can love our kids just because they are ours. We can love our family just because they are ours. We can love the family of God because they belong to us through Jesus. Amen. You know, if we give this unconditional acceptance and affirmation and affection to our children, we build on a, a relationship, on a foundation of love. And then when it's time for correction or guidance, it's much more easily received when you've got that foundation of love. You know, a few days ago, my husband, Bayless, him right there, <laughs> he went out to get some groceries. And uh, when he got back, I looked at some of the groceries. I questioned him. I said, why'd you get that kind of water? And like, this cheese is not organic. <laughs> and in the midst of saying that, it just dawned on me. What am I doing? I should just really be grateful. He went to the grocery store. <laughs> and I felt so bad. <laughs> you're right, you're right. <laughs> but I felt so bad. I felt like a bad wife. I felt like a horrible person. Man, I'm just complaining about all this. And uh, the truth is, really, that no one gets it right all the time. Jesus is the only perfect one. And when we blow it, we can tell God, I was wrong. I am sorry. And he'll forgive us and cleanse us. And we can tell our spouses, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Talk about power in our words. Those are some powerful words. I'm sorry. I forgive you. I love you. Please. Thank you. There is power in our words. In fact, as the Bible tells us, life and death. Bayless? You know, the Old Testament patriarchs spoke words over their families that came to pass. And we can bless or curse our family. And I think when the world knocks our family down, we ought to be able to put them back on their feet with the words we speak. All right, second power we want to talk about is the power of example. We can destroy much of the effect of good words through bad example. Old proverb, what you are, speak so loud I can't hear a word you are saying. First Peter 5 and 3 says, don't lord it over the people assigned to your care but lead them by your own good example. That's talking about a shepherd and a flock, but you know, my family, that's, that's my own little flock. And I'm to lead them by good example. Example is a powerful thing, but the Philippians, the apostle Paul wrote, the things that you've seen and heard in me, do those things. Follow my example. 
Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4 and 12, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And the word that he used there, for example, it's interesting. It literally means to stamp. It means to strike with force and leave an imprint. That's what the word example, when he said be an example, leave an imprint on people's lives. Some of you are old enough to remember the old typewriters we used to have. Some of you young people, you find one in a museum somewhere maybe. <laughs> but when you'd press the keys, there's this little metal arm that had the letter on it. And it, with, with force, it would strike this ribbon with ink on it in the paper and literally strike with force and leave an indent in the paper with, with ink on it. That's the idea, an example. And the truth is, through our example, every one of us, we are typing on the lives and typing on the souls of those around us every day. We're leaving an impression. We're either typing self-control or out of control with my temper and my habits. I'm either typing love and forgiveness or I'm typing out, this is how you hold a grudge and this is how you let things turn bitter. I'm either typing out a message on my family members and my friends of honesty and integrity or I'm typing out a message of lying, breaking the rules whenever it suits me to do so. I was watching a Little League game one day. One of my grandsons was playing, and this kid on the other team got called out on strikes, and the kid threw a fit. He went berserk, took his helmet off, threw it at the umpire. He didn't just kick a little dirt toward the umpire. I mean, he threw his helmet, cursing like words you, you wouldn't even think that a, an eight-year-old would know had to be restrained. The kid just went crazy, and the ump said, get out, you're out of the game, and you have to leave the field. And the, the, you should have seen the parents in the stands. It was like utter shock to see this kid just turn into a wild thing and curse and scream over being called out on strikes. I wasn't shocked in the least. His dad was an assistant coach on that team, and I'd seen his dad do the same thing six weeks before. Some call by the umpire that he didn't like. He started throwing things and started cursing, had to be ordered off the field. Well, he'd been typing, leaving an imprint on the soul, on the life of his son through the power of example, and he was acting just like dad was. G. Campbell Morgan is a great pastor, theologian, and writer. Had five sons. They were all preachers. There was a guest in the home one day and asked the boy, says, which one of you's the best preacher? And in unison, all five boys said, mother. <laughs> Mrs. Morgan had never once in her life preached a formal sermon, but her life was a sermon. Her life was an example of what it meant to put God first and to serve others, you know, with the love of Christ. Her life was an example of what it was to follow Jesus. And you may not have had a good example, but you know what? You can turn things and, and leave a legacy for the coming generation, for your family, for your friends, by you choosing to be the right kind of example. Bedankt voor het kijken naar Antwoorden met Belis Conley. Belis gaat volgende week verder met deel 2 van zijn preek. I love talking about the family, especially together with my wife. Now, obviously, we didn't finish the message in this particular program, so you're going to have to join us next time for part 2 as we continue to talk about three powers in the home. You're not going to want to miss it. So, hey, mark your calendar, do whatever you need to do. We're going to get into the word together as we talk more about powers in the home. We will see you next time. God bless you. Heb je een uitzending van Belis Condi gemist? Op zijn website kun je op elk moment alle preken online terugkijken. Ga naar belis-condi.nl/slash mediatheek. 
Heeft de preek je aan het denken gezet? Dan hebben we voor jou een gratis aanbod op onze website over het onderwerp Ervaar de kracht van God. God wil je dragen als je zwak bent. Hij heeft de kracht en wil je deze kracht elke dag opnieuw geven. Maar hoe kunnen we deze kracht dan ontvangen? Belus Condi heeft een boekje over dit onderwerp geschreven. Ontdek Gods kracht voor jou. Download het boekje gratis op belus-condi.nl slash kracht en laat God je op zijn schouder stillen. Hier is Belus met een inspirerende gedachte die u vandaag al kunt toepassen. In one of my favorite verses from the book of Psalms says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And the word for house there actually is the Hebrew word for family. God is interested in your family. He's interested in building your family. He's interested in building the family through you. The words that you speak, the the attitude and character you display, that, that affects everyone in the home that you live with. None of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. Everything we do impacts other people. We're always sowing seeds of attitudes through our words into the lives of other people. And listen, God wants to build your family and make it strong. He wants to make your children rock solid. He wants to build your marriage. And I just want to encourage you, invite God in as the master builder that he might lead and guide you as you bless your own family. Bedankt voor het kijken naar Antwoorden met Belis Conley. Ga naar belis-conley.nl voor meer informatie en inspiratie. If you don't have a copy of my daily devotional Answers for Each Day, I'd like to encourage you to get one. It's a way to help discipline yourself to get some of the Word of God into your heart every day. And you know the scripture says that the inward man is renewed day by day. Jesus said man doesn't live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So you can get your daily spiritual bread, at least part of it, by reading that daily devotional every morning or every night. I give some thoughts. We share a bit on, on different scriptures and, and principles from the Bible. It'll be a blessing to you. Antwoorden voor elke dag. Bied je toegankelijke Bijbelse overdenkingen voor elke dag van het jaar. Maak er een gewoonte van om dagelijks deze Bijbelse waarheden te bestuderen samen met Belus. Je zult zien dat je geloof en je leven van binnenuit opgebouwd wordt. Bestel het dagboek nu. De gegevens staan in beeld. En ontdek antwoorden voor elke dag.